This is episode 111 of the Morse Code Podcast. Um, I'm here. Dan's here. I want to get right into it because we got a guy who we've been watching for since 2009. I didn't realize it had been that long that he's been covering the Celtics, but since 2009, um, it's A. Sherrod Blakely uh, from the uh, Guarded Report with CLNS, as well as some work with Bleacher Report, Boston Sports Journal. How are we doing, Sherrod? I'm doing good, and I'm glad to be here on episode 111. And mm. the reason why is because my birthday is November 1st, 111. So Ooh. this yeah, was meant that. to be. Yeah, Clearly, I was meant to be here for this episode. Yeah, we knew that, of course. That's why, of course. You know, that's why we scheduled for tonight. <laughs> but no, it's cool to have another, uh, another friend from CLNS Media uh, on with us. Real quick, how, how's, that been, tra- how's that transition been going from NBC Sports, Sports Boston over to uh, CLNS and some of the podcast and, and post game stuff you guys got going on. Well, it's it's cool because a lot of the guys that I'm working with, I've I've I work with in the past. Uh, Jimmy and I used to work together at NBC, excuse me, Sports Boston. John Zan is one of the uh, one of the key guys with CLNS Media. Him and I also mm-hmm. worked together at NBC. And the talent, you know, Joe Sway and and and, and some of the other guys, you know, yeah. Jeff Goodman, those types. I've known them forever, uh, so it it wasn't this kind of like. Hi, I'm the new guy. No, it's <laughs> we've kind of known each other for a while. So there really wasn't this whole um, uh, awkward first day of school vibe. Uh, we never had that. Uh, and, you know, I, in addition to the on camera and, and on air stuff I do, I, I also teach at Boston University. And yeah. um, and so I've had some of those folks come in and, and talk to my kiddies, although I will keep Jimmy away from mm, my kiddies. My Jimmy Toscano, that's my guy. But. I'm I'm afraid he may be a bad influence on, on my yeah. young people. So. Well, actually, he's not allowed within 500 feet of a school, isn't he? You know what? I thought they We're lifted that at the end of 2020. <laughs> okay, uh, but that might be right. You know, Safe I wouldn't bet. be surprised if it got yeah. extended. <laughs> yeah, the paperwork got mixed in like during the pandemic, so it, it has yeah. been extended. I looked it up before we not, started. Not great for Jim, but no, nonetheless. No. Sherrod, I had a question for you. So one of the first guests that we had on this show was your boy, Kyle Draper, last <laughs> summer. Great guy. Um, yeah. Happy for him in Sacramento. <clears throat> yeah. I remember there being video footage of him in the Celtics, like, media basketball game. Were you a part of that? Did you play in yeah, that game? Yeah, we, we played against each other a few times. Okay. So, NBC Boston did not dirty, because I remember they showed, like <laughs> – I don't remember exactly what the um, highlight was, but it, it wasn't flattering for him. So mm. how, how does your game rate up against his? At that period of time, Kyle had issues with me. Um, Boy. I always knew I knew how to win. Barbecue chicken alert every time you got the ball. <laughs> Look, I either would find a way to get buckets or find someone else to get buckets. Like a, 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 I would say that I was like a six foot one inch version of Draymond Green. Um, with a better jump shot, um, I defend, I deflect, I get my teammates involved, and when it's when it's go when it's go go time, I'm going to knock down shots. Um, mm-hmm. So does that mean you poke um, people in the eye too? No, and but I will. I will get on the ref though. I will absolutely get on, even if it's just like my cousin who will be refing the game. I will cuss <laughs> him out, uh, and I and I'm I'm one of the few people who who's picked up a tech in those type of games. Because uh, mm, usually they boy. just kind of let you go, but I, I've gotten a tech or two. Uh, never in the same game because that's an ejection. That's true. I know my limits. It's good to hear because, like I said, they they didn't show the uh, the most impressive um, Kyle. They didn't have anything to work with. Of course, <laughs> they didn't show the most impressive. They, not, you, you can't show impressive work. I mean, you know, uh, I well, got, how, how tall is players have bad highlights? Yeah. Right. How tall is how tall is Drapes? He's not terribly tall, is he? I think he no offense. lists him. I think he tells everyone he's six <laughs> one. Um, I I know I'm taller than him. Uh, yes. I don't tower over him, but I, I've got him by a little bit. Okay. I, I would say he's probably five eleven, six feet, something like that. Well, work with what you have. That's all you can do. That's all. He, that's all we all can do. You know. So I, I was going to actually transition to this before we get too much into the Celtics. Um, so you used to cover the Pistons, right? Yeah. You used to work with the Pistons. So, um, Soapy so, 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 so sent me this in the notes. I, I didn't, I didn't know the time frame, but so were you with Detroit during the the Malice in the Palace year, right? 
<laughs> yes, I was there. You were the one that started it, weren't you? That, that was my question, actually. It would have how much blame much is on Asherod Blake? I started it. I guarantee you, it would have ended much earlier. Okay. Much okay. earlier. That doesn't mean I would have beat the crap out of guys. It's just that it wouldn't have escalated like that. I'd just feel like, Ron, let's, dude, we're yeah. done. Let's go. Yeah. You guys won the game. Let's just yeah. call it a wrap. No, it yeah. was, yeah, I, I was there. And, and the way seating worked back then was that if you were uh, media, we were like literally on the front line. And mm-hmm. the thing that was so just incredibly bizarre about that is, and I've heard people talk about how, you know, how time just kind of slows down. And, and mm-hmm. I'm thinking like, that's just BS. That stuff never happens. Mm-hmm. Oh, it does. Because I vividly remember seeing Ron Artest get off of the, uh, near his bench and start running behind press row. And I'm looking at him because he's to my, he's to my right. And I'm looking at him and I thought I was saying, what the F are you doing? But the words didn't come out. It was like, what the F are you doing? (laughs) And he was running full speed because after I, after, because I was up to like maybe five in the morning looking at different video images and Mm -hmm. we showed in real time him running from where the cup of water hit him to getting up to the stands and it looked like he was in mud and then i'm watching it in real time and he's sprinting his ass back there to get up there and so that's when it hit me that that whole time really does slow down when things are like a little bit cuckoo crazy and a different kind of cuckoo crazy it's real um but that was the craziest night i've ever experienced in the nba um because yeah i would think so well, here the, here's the, well, I wouldn't say the worst part about it, but one of the worst parts about it was it was a Friday night yeah. and working for newspapers, you hate games that go long on Friday nights because it screws up your deadline. And mm-hmm. for that particular game, Indiana had won mm-hmm. for about maybe two minutes to play. And so I'm thinking like game stories written. I've called the desk, punching the final score. I've got plans for the Friday night. Life yeah. <laughs> is good. Life is good. Got my work done. Now I can play. Mm-hmm. And then Ron Artest decides, nah. We're working That's overtime tonight. Right. Your, <laughs> your night is, is – I'm about to change your night and your life right now. Yeah. And uh, it was it was crazy. I mean, there's so many things that, that happened and things that didn't happen that night that, mm-hmm. you know, it, it becomes a lot of what-if type questions. Like Jermaine O'Neal uh, just absolutely cracked this mm-hmm. one fan in the jaw. And I don't – I mean – I think over time people realize it, but in the, in that moment, we didn't realize how if it wasn't for one of them slip, I think it was Jermaine who kind of slipped when he threw the punch. Yep. If he didn't slip, he would have had, he would have cracked that guy straight on and probably would have killed him uh, mm. or at least put him in a hospital for a really long time, which would have cost Jermaine a lot more money than I think it probably cost him. Because as you can imagine, lots of civil suits we're uh, going out that night. Uh, it, mm-hmm. When I when I think about that in retrospect, I think about that that Oprah Winfrey um, commercial where you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. It's like you get a suit, you get a suit, you get a lawsuit, and mm-hmm. it was just an absolute zoo that night. Um, but it, again, it changed the way the NBA has never been the same since. Uh, mm-hmm. When you go to games now and you see like the little um, the the covered areas through the tunnel where guys come in and out, that wasn't there before the the brawl at the palace mm-hmm. and they did that specifically so that fans would not be able to throw things on players because that was when it didn't do- <laughs> it didn't dawn on anyone that if you were upset at a player and the game was over or the quarter was ending you could kind of go over to that railing area and just pummel them with whatever the hell you had in your hand yeah um, you could let water- them know <laughs> yeah water bottles uh bottle bottles mm-hmm. you know bottle caps Whatever you had handy, cans, you could throw it at them. And it wasn't until that night that we see that come up real up close and personal. It's like the line's like finally like crossing. Like yeah. this is like yeah, really what could happen. Yeah, it was like the NBA months. was just like, oh man, we got to yeah. make some changes here. This is <laughs> not cool. Yes, the, going into the stands bad, but the other little things like, you know, when they were trying to get the players off the court and they were just getting pummeled with, yeah. with lots of crap. Uh, so the, the the NBA has never been the same. And uh, I, I was worried that one of the, and it, it didn't really matter as much over time, but one of my concerns at that moment was whether a guy like Ben Wallace would, would not get into the hall of fame because of that incident. 
Yeah. Um, because it, I mean, it was the, as you guys probably remember, it was like the biggest story for like years in mm-hmm. the NBA. And mm-hmm. I just remember Ben Wallace being so, and Ben and I, we, we talked about this uh, at, at one point afterwards. And he, his thinking was that my scoring is what will keep me out of the Hall of Fame, if anything does. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, if you think so, I was like, but look, <laughs> the, the Hall of Fame is not forgiving when they, they feel that you have been part of something that, you know, was with that doesn't exactly uh it's not politically correct or it doesn't yeah. really check up all the politically correct boxes i mean hell chris weber just got into the hall of fame and you can't tell me that chris weber this was the first year he should have been he should have been in three four five years ago mm-hmm. uh so i was worried about that for ben wallace but fortunately he will be going in next year which i'm, I'm excited about yeah um because i've i've been covering this game and, and covering college athletics for like 20 plus years and no one I've ever covered worked harder than Ben Wallace. No one. It's not even close. He is, you know, he's on that right. He's the first face that I etch on the Mount Rushmore of just guys who work hard in this league. It's not, there is no comparison there. Yeah. Wow. No, it's, it's, it's funny you mentioned the Jermaine O'Neal thing. Cause we had, um, who are we talking to? Oh, uh, Scott Pollard, NBA yeah. veteran. He was on the Pacers at the time. And bro, he Scott said the same. one T. Yeah, he but still he said the same thing. He's like he's like from the from an actual like up close view. It's like yes, that video went viral, whatever you consider viral back then of Jermaine O'Neal with that missed punch. Mm -hmm. But he's like, dude, if that connected, that guy's dead. Like that's not an exaggeration. That's like an everyday guy with an elite level athlete coming at you like a hundred miles an hour. Yeah, and and, right, and I I, think think it is the thing that I remember about that that was just you know. the guy was baiting Jermaine to hit him. He was just like, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, uh. He literally stuck his chin out, and Jermaine's just like, okay. Yeah. And you're, I mean, this guy, if that guy must have been like maybe 5'10, <laughs> maybe 230, 235. Jermaine is like 6'10, about 265, 270. And yeah. when you look at the replay, Jermaine cocks the arm back. I mean, it's like, you know, this isn't just like, you know, a little knockout punch. This was no, this was just like, you know, if you were playing a boxing game and you are in power up mode, Jermaine was fully (laughs) powered to absolutely destroy his face. Uh, And I'm just it it was just it was just such a just so many lives were forever changed in a bad way because one fan made a just a really dumb decision. Yeah. And you pick of all the guys on the Indiana Pacers team, you don't want to do something like that. He's probably one A or one B between him and Steven Jackson. Uh, yeah. The one difference, Steven Jackson is smart enough to know which one of the fans did that. Because Steven Jackson would have turned around and looked and would have figured out, okay, this is the window. I've got these three guys who probably did it. Who's mm-hmm. flinching? He's mm-hmm. flinching. That's the one I'm going. Yeah. Whereas Ron just got up and just just running. I mean, he who 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 wants some of this? And and the guy was just like. Yeah, I don't. Okay, <laughs> next thing you know, he can just ask what by Ron Artest. Yeah. Um, that was still one of the the wilder visuals of like, it would cut back, then cut again. And then eventually Ron Artest's jersey is just so stretched to the point, <laughs> covered in beer, like stretched yeah. out. Like, what is going on? <laughs> like, yeah, I remember when, what yeah, is I happening? Remember, yeah, I remember when uh, Rick Mahorn was, was trying to like grab him. And I'm thinking like, Rick, that's like you setting a screen. <laughs> you ain't doing that your his screens were just like i'm standing in my spot but moving screen no he was never yeah. called for a moving screen because that would require him to be moving so he had no <laughs> shot at all of getting him and the funniest part to me well not the funniest part one of the funnier moments was seeing rasheed wallace in the stands as the peacekeeper he was like legitimately trying yeah. to keep <laughs> peace and yeah. that's and when I, you know you just, fucked up that's when you know you <laughs> yeah. have hit rock bottom in terms of the levels of fuck the two that you could be at when he yeah. becomes your peacekeeper and yeah. we we laugh i mean we can laugh about it now but in in the moment i mean there was oh for sure it was just very intense I, i've never seen that level of intensity and and how you know it's amazing that no one got arrested that night uh, hmm. And there, and the reason why was because the assistant coaches on the Pacers did a hell of a job convincing the local police to not arrest some of the players. Because there hmm. were two or three players that they, the police I know had every intention of arresting that night, that but they were talked out of it by the Pacers assistant coaches. Hmm. 
Wow. Shout out to them. them. I don't know who that would have been at yeah. the time. Cause that was when was Rick Carlisle, the coach of the Pistons or the Pacers at that time. Pacers. Okay. Pacers. Mm-hmm. And Rick, I, I give Rick a lot of credit cause he did the best job he could at trying to keep the peace. Yeah. Uh, there was at one mm-hmm. point, <laughs> it makes me laugh thinking about it. Uh, Jamal Tinsley was like looking at me with this really weird look. And he's at this point, my deadline is blown. My night is ruined (laughs) and I'm going to have to be dealing with this shit for like the next however many months. So Uh I was not really in the mood for the, for the funky eye. And we just had this weird like moment and Rick who used to coach the Pistons and knew me obviously Mm. and knows Jamal. He just kind of looked at both of us. It was like, Jamal, let's go. And I was just like, that's a good (laughs) idea. Cause this, this is not the night to test Sherrod. That was so not the night. (laughs) Do you ever ever there was a night? That was not it. Do you so, ever look back and wonder, like, oh hmm, man, what would have happened if I had stepped in? What could I? I have bet you could square up Jamal Tinsley. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. No, my here's the thing that that I kept. I had to remind myself of as even though I was really pissed. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm there for a job. Right. I'm a professional, and and I, I got to keep myself as professional as possible. But I was absolutely prepared that if anyone put their hands on me, is all bets are off. Because at that point, I'm defending myself. Sure. Um, and so I made sure I kept my computer in my right hand, my right arm, and kept the left open because I'm a southpaw. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure that I'm still professional because I'm holding my computer, but don't yeah. get it twisted if you think that you can swing on me and I'm not going to swing back. So yeah. um, it was I mean, a crazy also, night, though. It was if, such if, a crazy night. If you need to throw hands, you can live live stream it right there. See, live streaming was not that in back in. Oh, area. good point. You can like post it to your MySpace, like in real time. <laughs> right, right. MySpace. I, I, <laughs> or whatever. I, 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 have yeah. not, I have so forgotten about MySpace until you just brought mm. it up. I totally forgot that was a thing. Until you sure just was. It up. Yeah. It's actually um, our biggest platform. Oh, We're big amazing. in the MySpace world. Oh, Millions that's, of subscribers. That's uh, unfortunate. But yeah, go, go ahead. So I didn't. Uh, I didn't intend to spend so much time on this in the palace, but it's always nice hearing actual people who were there talk about what a nightmare that was we talk about this a lot too it's like in this this big like documentary they're making a documentary about everything now yeah i'm waiting for that one man i I feel like there's got to be enough like first person footage for espn to put something together my thought is it was an espn game so maybe they're hey this probably isn't the best thing to to bring back up now that we're owned by disney (laughs) but i I think that'd be an interesting one to see I mean, I think what they would, if they were to do something like that, I think they would try to frame it in the, this is how this really bad thing happened that brought about all this good. Look at all the safety stuff that we have at arenas. Look at how Mm. Ben Wallace is now going into the Hall of Fame. Look at Ron Artest, who has brought mental health into the forefront as something that we should talk about and and embrace. And there is a lot of good that did come about it. But to be candid with you, if I'm watching a documentary about it, I don't want to see that shit. Yeah, good point. I want to I, I want to know what happened when the police were about to put their hands on players to take their asses to jail. Mm-hmm. Talk me through what happened there. Tell it. But the, the challenge that I think any company that wants to do like a, a documentary is getting the folks that actually have something to say to talk. Yeah. Um, they I know Ben, you know, he's talked about it, obviously. Uh, quite a few times, but I don't know if he has an appetite for that per se. Uh, same thing with Rick Carlisle, uh, who, I mean, everyone around me knows. Rick is one of my favorite coaches. I think he is just an absolute, he's the shit uh, as a coach. Um, I And I, I, I based it on the fact that he, when he was in Detroit, he was there for two years, but damn, that first team he had was just, ugh. And he was able to get 50 wins out of them, which to me is one of the more amazing coaching jobs I've ever seen. Cause that was not a 50 win team. Um, but Rick, I don't anticipate would have much to say about the document or something like that. Uh, yeah. and, and you'll find some players. Sure. But the players that you want to hear from, you want to hear from Jermaine, you want to hear from Ben, you want to hear from Ron, you want to hear from Steven Jackson, although Steven Jackson, he's got another set of, of, of issues that he's, he's got with some now. concerns of, Ooh, uh, of his own yeah. this week. Yeah, sure does. Kwame ain't that dude. I'm just Kwame is not that guy. Yeah. Kwame is truly about all that smoke. Uh, Mm. uh, (laughs) Kwame is not the one to go. And to me, you know, you're dealing with a true, true, true badass when everyone who comments about you 
mm -hmm. inserts some type of apologetic language. Like, I really didn't mean how you took that, Kwame, or yeah. look, we, I, I got nothing but <laughs> love for you, brother. <laughs> Or, yeah. you know, and, and you, you see that that that's consistent with anyone and everyone who was touched on that. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and as someone and, and I go back with Kwame back to when he was in high school uh, and actually my first time seeing him up close, I was I was covering the ACC at the time. And there's this uh, they had this thing called the uh, Peach Jam Classic and it's a tournament and it's in Augusta, South Carolina. Um, and this particular year you had Kwame Brown. You had Eddie Curry and you had Tyson Chandler all at and, and on the same place. And so mm -hmm. it was a really big deal because everyone had projected him as top five, top 10 picks in the draft that year. And so I went and saw every single game that those guys play, including the games when they played head to head. And I came away feeling and mo most of us who were there felt the same way. Kwame Brown was the best player of mm -hmm. those three. Hands down. Tyson Chandler, just too. I mean, look, too light. Can't deal with that kind of muscle. He ate him up. Eddie Curry, yeah, he had some strength, but Kwame had athleticism along with the strength. So Eddie Curry really couldn't handle him. And Kwame could deal with him at the other end of the floor because, again, strength-wise, he is very comparable to Eddie Curry, and he was athletic. So mm -hmm. Kwame established himself. I wouldn't say established. He cemented himself as the number one high school prospect and, frankly, the number one player overall. At the, in that in that that weekend, and the thing that jumped out to me back then was that Kwame was just strong as hell. I mean, he was he was the way that we look at Stephen Adams today, mm -hmm. from a strength standpoint, is the way so many of us looked at Kwame back then. And so, keeping in mind that when he was young, he was unusually strong. As you get older, you tend to get a little bit stronger as you get older. And then when you become like you know where he's at now, where he's past his playing days there's this thing that i like to refer to as old man strength mm -hmm. that kicks in so kwame he's got just human being superior strength now he's got that intangible that we know as old man strength you ain't messing with that dude yeah. if you have any value for your life you are not trying to square up with him and he's and he's, this, he's 610 by 290 hasn't really put on a hasn't really kind of you know gotten out of shape since he since he stopped playing. He looks mm. pretty damn good shape wise. I was and, gonna say, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not the guy you want to mess with. Right. You, you do not want that smoke. Uh because there real there is serious fire with that smoke. It's not just like little little puffs. This isn't <laughs> like you know puffing a cigar flame yeah, yeah. And, and that no no this is like you're raising inferno if you get too close to that those that smoke fire. So yeah these aren't these aren't just fleeting embers from uh, Kwame Brown. Nah. No, smoke I, 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 the only thing I would tell Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson is be careful, y'all, because um, Kwame, boy, you know, he's and and again, I'm not trying to in any way, shape, or form engage this dude. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, we're sending this straight to him. <laughs> we're sending this any, straight to him. This is Ashrod's alibi for Kwame Brown. Absolutely, I'm not trying on. to go with that dude. Hell no. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, smart man. And but the, the thing that I find curious though is that it, it, it feels and, and again, Kwame, you know, why he's feeling the way he is right now, only Kwame knows that, and that's for him to explain at some point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, because the jokes that they're they're making about him are old. It's been like that for a really long time about him, you know, being yeah. a boss. And the, the thing, and I asked, I talked to a scout about this a couple nights ago, and and obviously, you know, Kwame came up in conversation. Mm -hmm. And the one thing he said to me, and I, and I think this is true, Kwame spent 12 years in the NBA. Yeah. There is no way that you can be a bust in the mm -hmm. best league in the world and get 12 years. Right. I mean, did he live up to being a number one pick? No. He wasn't as good as you would expect someone picked that at that point in the draft should be. But to say that he had he was a bust, I wouldn't say that. Did he have a disappointing career? Yeah, I can buy that. I can buy that. But by no means was he a bust. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. should do man made over sixty two million dollars. I'm sorry, let me be the bust. I will be the bust. I will be that twelve yeah, year bust any day if I can leave with sixty two million. And that's just salary. We're not talking about the endorsement deals and, mm -hmm. and, and and things that he was able to get on the side. So, Kwame, uh, uh definitely not a bust. Uh, the only thing that busts on that dude is the bank account because sixty two million in twelve years. Just do the math. That's five plus million a year. Yeah, I'm sorry, but it's five plus 
five million and some change per year. And we're talking I live in Los Angeles, early, early 2000s. So even mm-hmm. so you're doing OK, mm-hmm. you're, you're doing OK. And if you and you, you use your money right, which I, I my understanding is he was pretty smart with his money. Yeah. Kwame's going to be OK, which makes mm-hmm. me wonder why is all this coming up now? And the only thing I can think of is that this has kind of been festering for 20 some odd years. And it was just the wrong day, wrong time where he heard what they were saying. And he just exploded. And after the after the grenade went off, he's looking at the carnage. He looks, he sees he's got a couple more grenades, and he's just blowing everything up now. I mean, mm-hmm. first it was Steven Jackson and then Matt Barnes. Then you got Stephen A. Smith, you got Jamel Hill. It's like, damn, Kwame is yeah. coming for everyone. Everyone. Yeah. Charlemagne the God. I mean, he, he's he is just not <laughs> holding back mm-hmm. anything. Yeah, so. DJ Envy, Angela Yee. Yeah. I, like, I wasn't yeah. expecting to hear the the Breakfast Club uh, get in the yeah. crosshairs of Kwame Brown, but here we are. I, I, when, I, when I saw that one, I was just like, wait, wait, wait what? <laughs> I, I guess the, the, the weird thing for me is that most of the people who are commenting of late are acting, what they're saying makes sense. Like, folks, y'all need to leave Kwame alone. But his issue with Charlemagne, though, I, I was that Charlemagne brought up some personal things that Charlemagne didn't really know the full story behind. And Kwame was pissed about that because it, it the stuff that he's talked about made it seem as though Kwame, you know, had a certain roughness about his, his upbringing. And while there may be some remnants of that be true, Charlemagne wasn't qualified to have that conversation. And that was Kwame's issue. Um, but man, I, I, look, we don't want that smoke from Kwame. And we, we all know that smoke. I agree. We we all know Charlemagne approaches everything with extreme subtlety and what a weird you know, he guy. likes to hedge his bets. So right. I can't imagine he said anything too uh, too inflammatory about him. No, or... but but you know what? But the thing <laughs> is that you're dealing with Kwame. You know he's a little on the edge right now. <laughs> yeah. Just just walk away. I, I walk would do away. the same. He's on I, tilt. I can confidently he's driving say 150 I... on the freeway making Instagram live videos. But go ahead, Soap. I was just going to say, Sherrod, I know you find this hard to believe. I can confidently say I'm the best at what I do, and I definitely don't make $62 million. I'd rather be the worst at what I do. And um, Yeah, that's rock bottom in the NBA, to Sherrod's point. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in. To live in Los Angeles for half my career, $62 million, I can get on board with that. All he had to do was be drafted like 24th and have the exact same It wouldn't be a story. All, all would be well. Yeah. Yeah, if, that'd if be that, a hit. Be, some people say, man, you know what? Kwame has such a great career. If only he was drafted a little bit higher with a better team, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, Thanks, MJ. I, <laughs> I, like, you know, people, you know, have, have talked about how, man, it kind of sucks that he got drafted by the Wizards and MJ and all that. Mm-hmm. And I keep coming back to, no, I, I don't feel bad for him because he made a lot of money playing a game that he loves. Mm-hmm. And... It is what it is. I mean, he was a player that he was supposed to be. Yep. Um, you can go, you can, we can play, you know, revisionist history about if only, if only all we want, but we can't. Bottom line is he played 12 years. He was the number one pick. He made 60 plus million dollars on salary alone. Kwame's had a pretty good life. So I mm. no, no sympathy, no, no crocodile's tears on this end for him. Um, okay. <laughs> so none. Well, to take it from, uh, old basketball to present day 2021 what do we have to expect or what should we realistically hope for uh in these next four Mm. maximum games against the brooklyn nets at least four wow at least four and that's that's i'm saying nets in three but i don't know (laughs) if here's this is what i think um i think that if jalen brown were around I think they could push him to five or six games. I think Jalen. I think Jalen could have that kind of impact. I think they could push Brooklyn to five or six games. One game, Jalen would just have one of those amazing nights, and Tatum would be really good, and Kimball would be knocking down shots, and they'll win by like five. Yeah. Um, and another game, you know, they'll Kyrie or Kevin or, or James Harden will be out, and that'll give them a chance, and they may be able to steal another one. But without Jalen, I don't see them getting a win. I mean, really? I'm hoping I'm hoping they can just win a quarter at this point, which which to me will be <laughs> a good. That will be a good. Brooklyn is insanely good. 
Yeah, I they're mean, quite good. We we talk we talk about Kevin Durant and and Harding and and you know and Kyrie all we want to, and they're amazing players. But the idea that Joe Harris is going to get open looks, mm-hmm. the idea that Bruce Brown is just going to be able to run up and down the damn court freely all he wants, their role players are wired to take advantage of the fact that you can't do anything with them other than give them more space than they than they should. You can't leave Joe Harris open, and yet you don't have a choice. Yeah. You don't want to let Bruce Brown go buck wild, yet you don't have a choice. You know Blake Griffin can't guard anybody anymore, but he's still, now that he's out of Detroit, he still mm-hmm. has the ability to do chin-ups on you if you don't pay mm-hmm. attention. You just, got, you just got to go at him on defense. Watch um, out, Luke Cornett. My goodness. No. I mean, somebody Blake Griffin <laughs> is dunking on somebody. I don't know who. I don't oh, know when. Inevitable. But it'll, it will happen. Someone will Mark be smart. They will be victimized. They will be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it's going to be like, damn, why did I have to switch out on him? Damn. Mm-hmm. Why couldn't you stay with him so I didn't have to switch out and get caught up in that? It's yeah. going to happen. It's, if they can listen, it, it's, it's going to be, it, I think it has the potential to get really ugly. And now, and that was one of the things we talked about on, um, on the garden report and then some of the other things we do about mm-hmm. whether it, is it better to officially get into the playoffs and play a team like them and get your ass whipped versus not getting into the playoffs, getting a lottery pick that maybe could want to be in a number one pick, slim chance to none, but it's right. still a chance. Um, worst case scenario, you wind, wind up picking somewhere in the middle of the first round, late lottery, that type of stuff. Was Is that a better scenario for these guys or not? And We've had some we, we we're very divided on that. Um, our our CNL, yeah. CLNS family is very divided on that. I'm of I'm of the mindset that anytime you can extend your basketball season and you've got a young team uh, mm-hmm. with a lot of guys in roles that they're not used to being in, I think you need to learn from that. Um, yeah, sure. I think I think Tatum going through the playoffs as the centerpiece for the first time in the mm-hmm. NBA, I think that's good for him. Uh, I, I think Kimball Walker who is as healthy now as he's ever like him. wasn't even this healthy last year come playoff time. Mm. That is going to be good for him to see what can I do when I'm healthy in the postseason? Because in Charlotte, I mean, they only went to the playoffs, I think maybe twice. And I think they got swept like both times or something like that. So Kimba, healthy Kimba can be really good. And Fournier play for that money, bro. Play like, it. play like, you know, play like, you know what we already know, and that is this is a contract year. You want to get twenty million, ball out against Brooklyn. Sure, yeah. you ball out against Brooklyn. Put the Celtics in a real jam where it's like we don't want to pay you twenty million, but damn, but you was busting Kyrie and you were giving James Harden a business, and you were dropping dimes. I know we got swept, but you was you did your thing. Mm-hmm. You did your thing, and, and so they need guys to play like the, play like this thing matters. Play with some pride. Play like you aren't trying to be that team to get swept because they sure. know they know everyone expects them to get the get the Hoovers and the and the dust mops and and all that stuff. I wouldn't be surprised if in game one, in game one, you see Brooklyn fans showing up with the brooms, and then you ask them why y'all doing this right now, and they're just like, yeah, you know, just getting a little stuck. Might as well, early. Yeah. <laughs> the early jump on things because we're gonna be whipping these out at some point, so we might as well just oh, get man. it ready now. Yeah, it, it let's gets get our cut. practice strokes in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That would, that exactly. Would stink. We, we just like the best, man. We just try to get our practice in because we, we know this is a wrap. Mm. And I hope the Celtics can prove all of us wrong. I really do. Because I it would be one gamble. of the greatest basketball stories of our generation if they can somehow beat this team uh, in a best mm-hmm. of seven. There, there's a, even if Kyrie, even if two of their big three get hurt, I still give them the edge. And mm-hmm. I and I and I because I just think their role That's players crazy, at this point, but accurate. Their, their role players at this point are feeling like y'all know as soon as y'all just say the word, I mean we'll take over. I yeah. mean, they because Brooklyn has beaten them with just Kyrie mm-hmm. in the regular season, and that to me was maybe one of the more disappointing losses of the season because if you can't beat them with one third of their big three, what the hell are you gonna do with Kevin Durant who had who there's no one who can guard him. Yeah. What are you going to do with James Harden, who has been like just the playmaker that Russell Westbrook could be, but isn't because mm-hmm. James Harden can shoot and James Harden can draw content and James Harden can, and can do a lot of the same things, but only better. They, 
I just uh, I want the Celtics to be competitive. And by competitive, I mean like don't get your ass pulled by 25 points, games one, two, three, and four. Uh, yeah. Make sure that you fight with these guys. But I, I was listening to Brad earlier today, you know, just kind of going through. He was asked a question about how, um, you know, looking at this Brooklyn team, just his thoughts on, on what they would, you know, need to do, you know, going into the series. And, I mean, just to hear him talk about, you know, that, you know, they're going to have to do a great job of controlling the controllables. Uh, I love mm-hmm. that one. I love that. I love, I like that one better than, you know, being the best version of who of, of us. I, I, I like to control the controllables better. Um, and I'm thinking, even if you can control the controllables, you can't do a damn thing with Kyrie, who can break down everyone in the league mm-hmm. at will. Mm-hmm. You got Kevin Durant, who is a seven-foot shooting guard. You can't contest his shots. When he misses, don't get it twisted. Your defense had nothing to do with that. <laughs> he missed because he's human. He yeah. misses shots because he's human. You don't think Tristan Thompson's going to lock him up? (laughs) Please don't get me started on Tristan. Please don't get me started on Tristan. We we have had a couple things. As a person, I'm a big Tristan Thompson fan. I've never watched his girlfriend wife's show. I may be the one person in the world who's never watched the Kardashians. There's their show. I've never seen it. Um, And I'm very proud of that, by the way. That Um, is impressive. But Tristan is a good dude. But I feel like he's that used car that when you look at what you're supposed to be getting and then you get in the ride and you realize like six, seven, eight things you thought you were getting don't work. (laughs) It's still a nice used car. It's just not as nice as you thought it was. Uh, Tristan doesn't hold his ground in the post as well as I thought he would. He doesn't defend as well as I thought he would. He doesn't switch out defensively on, on smaller players as well as I thought he would he gets moved too easily and the one thing he does that to me is at the top of my damn I hate when you do this list when he gets rebounds he brings the ball too damn low and I I the CNL CLNS guys they know I rant about that shit every single game and I remind them when I was in Detroit I remember me and Rasheed Wallace we were having a conversation and and full disclosure I love Rasheed Wallace uh, absolutely love him to death. He's one of my favorite people on the planet. Sheed, we were talking about rebounding and defense, and he, you know he was just saying how, because um, I, I comment on how he never brings the ball low, and he talks about that's what he's taught in high school. That's what Dean Smith taught him at UNC, and then he said, put it this way: if I bring the ball low, even somebody like yo ass could guard me if when I bring the <laughs> ball low. And, and and I thought like what after I got after I you know kind of let my feelings to the side and not be hurt that he thinks that I'm a bad defender. Yeah. And thought, actually started thinking about what he said. He's right. I mean, if you six eleven and you bring the ball down low and I'm six one, hell yeah, I could defend you. I could pick your pocket. I could strip you. Mm-hmm. I, you, you have made us equals. And that frustrates the hell out of me about Tristan. Cause when he brings it down low, not only does he make it easier for the defender to defend him at that point, but he risks getting stripped. He risks turning the ball over. And he, yeah. it's, just, it's just maddening watching him do that. Uh, but again, good guy. Um, I think he means well. I, but I, I just feel that this, this is one of those used vehicles that, you know, what was on the, the blue book was in the blue book. Is not, that's not what I got. It's not what I got. Mm, swindled. I know you guys are, are boys with this guy, but it reminds me of someone who's prominent in the basketball media now a little bit. He used to wear number 43 for the Celtics. Don't tell him I said that. Oh, but boy. Listen, don't, you can't talk about my boy for Beaumont. That's my <laughs> dude. That's my dude. I love me some Perk. Asking for it. No, I do love me some Perk, too. Me I too. love me some Perk. I, and listen, the thing about Perk, Perk's got lots of haters out there. Oh, my God. So <laughs> many haters out there. And I love it. I love it. I love it because they try to go at Perk a little bit, Mm-hmm. But they kind of they kind of know that's probably not a good idea. I mean, when you think about the guys that Perk has played with, I mean, he's played with Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook, uh, you know, LeBron James. I oh, mean, yeah, he, I mean, he's played. I mean, if you go down and list like the top 10 players in the game right now, he's played with at least half or more. And that gives you a certain cachet when you speak. People, you know, he speaks from, I've been in a locker room with these guys. I've been on the floor with those guys. I know them better than probably anyone in the media does. And 
the one thing I that I respect about Perk is that he doesn't sugarcoat his comments the way a lot of former athletes do. Mm. I mean, he's called out Kevin Durant before. He's and, and you know Kevin Durant, you call him out. It it look, it immediately goes to the to the to the phone, and he you know he's got the Twitter fingers rocking. That's just how Kevin Durant. Gets out. <laughs> Um, either on either that or the or you know or the uh you know the the, the phone that that we that we don't know he has um yeah, that right. we ultimately sure. find out he does right um so perk is is great for that stuff and uh you know him and i and I, I've, I've known Perk since he's been in the league uh he's been great to me uh i did not think he would be this good on tv and then again i've told us before i the, th- the thing that I wasn't sure if it was whether he was going to be candid and authentic. Uh, mm-hmm. It's one thing when you and I are sitting around and we're having some adult beverages and we're just we're just shooting the shit. That's one mm-hmm. thing. But when you got the cameras rolling and you got Rachel Nichols asking you about, you know, Kevin Durant and, and James Harden and all that, and and you're giving that what I like to call that straight no chase of truth, mm-hmm. that's real. That's why Per resonates. Uh, and, and, and he found what all great folks find is a catchphrase carry on yeah <laughs> can't see those words anywhere when i think about perk and yeah. i and i when, it, when he did i was like perk man i love you boy this is some good shit mm-hmm. uh he he's he's good people he's good people and again haters y'all gonna hate that's okay because perk's yeah. my guy i love Perk. you hear that soapy no no hatred here okay. uh now with that being said i want to get into some rapid fire questions with you sherrod okay i think I think you may find these interesting. If not, then uh, I will fake it. Yeah. Nice. Perfect. I was gonna say bad segment on that. my part. If not, um, yeah, I'll fake it. Fair enough. Okay. <laughs> I, we're gonna alternate, so I'll go first. Um, favorite non-Celtic currently. Current. Pl- you're talking current player. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, favorite non-Celtic currently. Ooh, good question. Oh, Julius Randle. Hmm. Kentucky guy. Interesting. I've come a, Very interesting I have come answer. a long way on Julius Randle. Um, when he was in college, I liked him. When he was uh, gearing up for the draft, I did not like him. And I did not like him because I thought that he was intentionally trying to direct hit himself to certain teams. Uh, and so uh, I didn't like I don't like when players like basically bullshit through certain workouts and then go all out in others. Um, right. But Julius Randle is a hell of a player. He's having a hell of a year. He to me, is most improved. And to be frank with oh, yeah. you, he may be the guy that cost Jason Tatum 30 plus million dollars. Because if Tatum and Julius are like, and I think they're going to be two guys vying for one of those last spots on an all NBA third team, Julius might get it over him. And that's going to cost Tatum like 30 plus million dollars, which is like, damn. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, Julius Randall. Okay. Um, this one could be a simple yes or no, but I'm sure it's not. Uh, Carmelo Anthony, best college season ever. Oh hell yeah! I'm, I'm so I'm, I'm like the worst person to ask about that. Yeah, um, I mean, led a school that had never won a national championship before to a national championship in his only season there. Uh, Carmelo Anthony is a god in yeah. upstate New York. And while I'm speaking of guys, shout out to Troy Weaver, uh, who is the GM of the Detroit Pistons, who was an assistant coach in Syracuse who recruited Carmelo to Syracuse. So mm. Troy gets major props. Troy and I, we, we've had this conversation. He will never, ever buy a drink in upstate New York for the rest of his life. And in okay. my presence, Troy has never bought a drink and never will. If he, if we're in the same room and he wants something to drink, I will find a way to pay for <laughs> it. Cash, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, I have them all, and I will be glad to put his his bar tab on mine. That must have been a great, like, fucking month in your career, I assume, because so that was March of 03, the March Madness tournament. So that was going on, and the Pistons, that was, like, the beginning of their run, right? They went to, yeah, they, um, 03, when, when Melo led the Qs to the title, the, the Pistons were in the playoffs, and that was the year – where they got to the conference finals and they lost, I think they lost to the New Jersey Nets that yeah, year. Yeah, that was the last Laker championship, yeah. I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that was yeah. So that that was that was awesome. That was just an awesome time. Awesome okay. time. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So that debate settled. Carmelo Anthony. Go ahead. So changing gears a little bit here. Who's more deserving of their Hall of Fame? Um, 
a guy who Hall of Fame against- discussion. Yes. Well, no. Who's more deserving of getting into the Hall of Fame? Okay. Robert Ori or Julian Edelman? I'm going to go with Robert Ori. Oh, and, boy. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Because Ooh. Robert Ori has more championships. Robert Ori has – and when you start breaking down moments that led your team, that got your team that – championship like late game end of the when when everything every everybody's chips are in the middle of the table i got one hand to play robert horry's hand damn near every time was better than anyone else's and that's no disrespect to julian elvin because he's a hell of a player but Mm. robert horry is as clutch as clutch can be i mean and i've seen it up close and the the thing about robert horry is that he makes he has made plays in a clutch that there was no sign that those plays were going to be made at any point before that. Like the year where the Pistons played them, 2005 when he was in San Antonio, and the Pistons are up 3-2. No, they're up 3 – yeah, they were up 3-1. It was, game, it was game five in Detroit, and the Pistons had a chance to take control of the series, and they got the game one. And Rasheed Wallace switches out on Manu Ginobili because Tayshaun got beat off the dribble, and he should not have left Robert Horry open. Tayshaun didn't rotate back in time. Horry hits the game winner. That's it. That's it. That was the, uh, that was such a dagger shot, but it was such a Robert Horry moment. He's always ready for that. Um, yeah, I, I, it's it's got to be Robert Horry. And I, I would imagine anybody outside of New England would agree. Um, you notice mm. I said anyone outside of New England yeah, would I heard agree. You. Okay. Mm-hmm. We're going to send this to Edelman too. I said we'd send okay. it to Kwame Brown. We're going to send this to everybody outside of New England. Yeah. Personal okay. there you go. There you mail go. and ballot envelopes. There you go. Okay. Outside Fair of New enough. England, I'm good. Shit. Yeah. All right. Uh, quick one from me. Detroit style pizza or Boston? I didn't really eat pizza. Maybe like food in general, like yeah. Boston cuisine versus Detroit food. I'm going to go with Detroit. I'm going to okay. go with Detroit. Uh, because uh, here's the thing. I'm a big soul food guy. Detroit has better soul food. It's that simple. Okay. I don't have an issue with Boston food. I mean, I, if I were big on seafood, which I'm not, Boston yeah. would be great. Right. I mean, I, I like clam chowder. Uh, I'm not big on, on um, sushi and all that other stuff, but no, yeah, okay. I would take Detroit. Fair enough. You, you don't leave a Celtics game and go straight to like Union Oyster House or something like that? <laughs> No, that hasn't do. been on the to-do list after games. Okay, I try so. not to make plans after games anymore to the damn palace malice. I yeah, find it doesn't point. it makes the night go easier when I don't know what I'm gonna do after the game because in case something happens in the game that throws yeah. me off, I don't want to have to change up all my plans. So maybe less of those like honey, I'll be home soon texts and like just Let's just see how this thing plays out. We're just going to watch the game. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get home. I'll see you when I see you. Don't, don't wait up too late. I'll get home when I get home. (laughs) Just keep your phone on you. Uh, Best road arena in the NBA to see a game. Best road arena. Yeah. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good way to go. Sophie. (laughs) Thank you. Nice job. So professional. Best road arena. Oh man. Cause I can think of the worst. That's Washington. They suck. (laughs) Wait, what's what's bad about wow. Washington? Washington, oh, it, it's, it's like being back in Boston. They're, they're, the Whoa. Celtics fans outnumber them. It's it's it doesn't feel like a road game. Oh, I got. Oh, you. okay, okay. At all, yeah, I was. Yeah. You know, actually, you know what? It's not that hard. Um, Golden State. Mm. When they were playing out in in Oakland, uh, it's one of the g- tie between Golden State and Toronto. Uh, Golden State because of the atmosphere. It's just, they've always been good, but Toronto, crazy. Yeah. I mean. That's the only place where it's been so loud where I literally saw my table moving. That doesn't happen anywhere else. And mm. back when I was going there regularly, Toronto wasn't very good. I mean, this was like when I was in Detroit and we and I go up there twice a year, you know, they weren't that good. And yet the yeah. fans were like ridiculously amazing. So my all my thoughts were if Vince Carter could ever like lead this team to a championship or at least a, a contender this place would be insane so okay uh last one for me better trash talker kg or rashid at their peaks i'm gonna go with kg yeah uh, 
I'm gonna go with KG slightly over she, and because <laughs> KG made it very personal. Yes, he made speaking he made, of Carmelo. Yes, <laughs> he made players feel very emasculated by him. Um, yeah, and and the thing about it is this: I respect the hell out of him for that. Mm-hmm. I have 100 respect for figuring out a way to use not only your talent but your tongue to get inside mm. guys head and throw them off. Um, and he, and he, he always <laughs> had a way of just, just owning you. Yeah. I mean, you know, everyone is trying to like buy, you know, everyone is trying to rent real estate inside another guy's head. Kevin, it wasn't about rent. He owned shit. He owned property in all <laughs> guys. Head. Yeah. It was just a matter of when is daddy landlord. coming home? Yeah. When is daddy coming home <laughs> to this property? That's all it really came down to. Yeah. You know I live in there. You you know this. Um, no, I I I love watching him play. Love watching the just the Jedi mind trick games that he used to play with guys. Um, but she was good though. Uh, mm-hmm. one of my favorite she moments actually was uh Zadrunas Ilgoskis played for Cleveland uh years ago, mm-hmm. seven footer from Lithuania, I think. Oh yeah. And she this particular game was absolutely busting his ass. I mean, she'd had baseline bank shot up and under post-up moves and she was laughing at him like mm-hmm. literally laughing out loud at him and then Zadrunas was getting frustrated and he tried to make like a hard foul on sheet and he missed him and fell and so she started laughing and there's this uh official um Jack Nice Jack, Jack Nice long time official mm-hmm. he teed Rashid up and we're all looking like what did he do he teed him up for laughing yeah and that was a moment when I said you know what I've resisted the like Rashid is getting screwed by the refs mantra because I didn't buy that. But when you get teed up for laughing at a guy whose ass you are kicking, that's personal. That's sure. that has nothing to do with anything other than you, the official, do not like this guy. You don't like him showing up another player, which frankly is none of your damn business, as long as he's not following him or calling him out of his name. He's literally laughing at him. Now, of course, the tech got rescinded afterwards but it it still it shouldn't have come to that yeah play better basketball all it's all that had to happen he just had to play better so my last one Sherrod KG made KG made people very uncomfortable very uncomfortable I was uncomfortable watching it from my television set so yeah Yeah. I know what you mean it's funny choice of words you said that uh as much with his play KG made people uncomfortable with his tongue because and you don't have to comment on this if you don't feel comfortable. Oh God! That was that was the Carmelo comment that he allegedly made. That's what people say. Oh, the Cheerios, honey nut yeah. Cheerios, delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have I, small I've, world. I've heard obviously that story many times. No one has been able to confirm that that actually happened. Uh, and so mm. I, I like that even better. I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I've been of the mindset that that might be one of those urban legend type things. Because remember, um, <laughs> that'd be so much better if that's the it, case. It would be. It would be. <laughs> um, but I, so I, I like my whole thing on that is I don't push back on that because it, it just makes for a great ass story. Um, but I haven't seen anything that anyone has told me who was around that team, around that play. Uh, they said, nah. And, and, and again, that's. <laughs> Um, Kevin is one of those people that, you know, almost anything you hear that he allegedly said, you kind of believe that that should happen. Oh, yeah. Um, Cause that's just, how, that's, that's just how it is. Mm-hmm. But, uh, the people I've, I've talked to about that say that they didn't hear him say that. Uh, and th- there's a couple of people that have to this day, they haven't lied to me, at least not where I could prove that they lied to me. Uh-huh. Um, and th- there's no benefit in them lying to me because it's not like Kevin is going to whip their ass or anything like that. He could, but he yeah. won't uh, because the story was already out there. So there was, there's no benefit. It's not like, Ooh, this is a big secret. Yeah. Uh, well, well, how did the story come out? I'm trying to remember like what, what was the first like, uh, like thing I assume wouldn't, I, I assumed it was a player on the court said they heard this. somebody. Yeah. Uh, somebody said that he said that, or they said, oh, yeah. a, they said a, a Celtics player said that. And mm. I think the, the, the way I recollect it coming out was, was it Kevin? And like, yeah, yeah, it was Kevin. So I'm not sure if the person <laughs> who started the story oh, yeah. actually. So Kevin just caught the story. blame for someone saying yeah. it. It was probably Pierce this whole time. <laughs> well, the, 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 one, the one guy that, that 
you know, people said it probably was, was Jamal Crawford. Or not Jamal Crawford. Uh, what's his name? The other Crawford. Jordan uh, Crawford? Jordan Crawford. Oh, God. Um, nah, now, KG's now, better. Now, KG would make for a better story. Definitely. Um, but I would not have been shocked if Jordan Crawford said something <laughs> like that. Yeah. And I am a huge Jordan Crawford fan. I mean, I uh-huh. he, he the job that Brad Stevens did in reclamating, just getting him to be a quasi decent point guard, an employee. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was amazing because Jordan was yeah. like one of the biggest shot chuckers in the game. And yeah. Brad actually were, was able to kind of tone, kind of ratchet the dial back at least four or five mm. decibels to where. He would jack shots, but he wasn't jacking like four or five shots in two minutes. Uh, right. He jacked like two <laughs> shots every four or five minutes. Yeah. And he would actually pass the ball to guys who were actually in position to score versus pass the ball in the perimeter and then clap for the ball to get back. So, <laughs> you know. Progress. Hey, people I mean, actually, People forget and then, that. that... Uh, and, no one, and no one wanted him afterwards, which I, I, I found really odd. Like mm. Golden State gave him like a cup of coffee for a little bit, uh-huh. but no one really showed him any love. And I was just like, damn, really? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know. if, if if you tell me that Jordan Crawford was the, the real focal point of that story, I believe it because he was the one that dunked on LeBron at LeBron's Nike camp that the tapes got buried. So mm-hmm. that guy's capable of anything as far as I'm concerned. Jordan Crawford is such a good dude, man. He's funny <laughs> as hell. He's yeah. like low-key funny. Uh, I wish he had more time in the NBA. Uh, one, because just from a simple content gathering standpoint, the dude is money. He takes care of you, uh, but but really more so because of his game. I thought he I thought he was one of those guys who kind of had a certain narrative about who he was as a player. Came to Boston, did what Brad Stevens asked him to do. Didn't grumble, didn't gripe, and just did his job. And then people look at him like, "Nah, we'll uh, you know we'll, we'll go in a different direction than that." Yeah. I, I felt bad for him in that regard, but Damn. again, you know the Cheerio <laughs> thing. I could see that being Jordan. <laughs> He played Let's, his uh, recent is 2017, 2018. And just pulled up his thing with New yeah. Orleans, actually. He went to New Orleans for a couple of years after Golden State. Yep. Damn. That second year in New Orleans, he had 14 a game. I'm just, I can't understand why that dude couldn't latch on anyway. He, and it wasn't <laughs> like he was a bad guy or a right. bad defender. Yeah. Um, but, but there's just certain players that, for mm. whatever reason, teams aren't really feeling them for some reason. Like, like, for example, Brooklyn, they just brought in Mike James, who was playing overseas. Uh, and I, 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 for the life of me, can't understand why Danny Ainge and his crew didn't think that a guy like Mike James could help them. Because Mike James literally got off the plane from freaking, I think it was Russia. Bags are still in baggage claim. Heads over to the arena. <laughs> bust the Celtics for like 10 points in 12 minutes. Don't know a damn play. Don't barely know his teammates. Only teammates he knew. I know James is on the team. Yeah. I know KD's on the team. I know Kyrie's on the team. And Joe Harris, he's going to pass me the ball because Joe know after I knock down a couple shots, I'm going to pass it back to him to do the same. Mm-hmm. And he 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 literally was the best reserve in that game that he literally came. I mean, he was, I mean, you talk about man off the streets. I mean, yeah. he absolutely bust the Celtics ass. Yeah. And I don't get me started on, on, on Danny he'll, and he'll also finger roll it from anywhere. Anyway. I'm cool with that. And, and, and as you guys probably know, finger rolls are hard to do. Um to just sure. get it right so that it just has that perfect just laid in the room. Because even if you lay it uh, up, not that hard. It's a beautiful play. It's a forgotten <laughs> art. Right? Yeah. It's hard. Because yeah. you want the ball to have a certain lift off your fingers and just kind of drop in gingerly. Yeah. But if you just finger roll, you want to get in a, in a cup. Yeah, you can do that. But I think of George Gervin when I think of finger roll. And there was no one mm. who had that beautiful just touch. Yeah. He was mm. the best. We'll end on a uh, a really interesting note, I think. My last question is, oh, what's a KG story um, that people might not know that you know from covering him for a few years? Um, let me see. One that KG won't kick my ass on. Let me see. I know you've been oh, covering all your alibis tonight. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's how you stay. That's how you survive in the game. Yeah, yeah that's how <laughs> you sure avoid getting kwami no exactly. shit. Uh, I love Kwame. Uh, actually, I covered Kwame when he he was in Detroit my last year in Detroit. Actually, mm. uh, they signed him to like a two year, eight million dollar deal. Um, I wrote a story about it. I did not dog him out. Uh, I brought up the fact that you know he was coming to Detroit with a chance to you know start over and and, and do some good shit. So, mm. Kwame, we're good on my content about you. <laughs> uh, KG story. I got one. 
Um, yeah. When KG was in Minnesota, this is when he was in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And you guys remember uh, one of his teammates, Joe Smith. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Joe Smith got into a little trouble uh, because he had this kind of under the table contract that he signed with Minnesota. And the league said, you know, Joe, bad Joe Smith, you got to go to another team. So he became a free agent, signed with Detroit, did did his one year bid in Detroit because that's basically what it was. It was like a one year bid, you know. And then you're free. You didn't. It was it's kind of like going to like basketball jail. One year bid in Detroit, get out, and then you're free. So as soon as he got out, he went back to Minnesota. So Detroit is playing at Minnesota first time since Joe left. And so you know, there's like three of us traveling media, and so we're in we're in the locker room and we're waiting to talk to Joe, um, because that's why we're there. And KG comes through and he sees us standing there and he just says, I'll be with you guys in a second. And we're like, oh, okay, okay. So Kevin goes back and we see Joe on like uh, like the, ex- not the exercise table, but he was just in- with the medical folks uh, getting rubbed down and, and, and all that, that, that kind of shit. And so Kevin comes back while Joe is still back there. And, and then he just kind of, you know, get, sits in front of us and says, <sighs> All right, let's go. And so we're like, so let's talk about Joe. And then we talked about Joe, and then we started coming with a bunch of other questions. But we talked for like 15 minutes, and it was the best 15 minutes of KG I have ever had. And the thing, the thing that I that my big takeaway was that I totally understand why guys would go through brick walls for this dude. Mm. He he was so passionate about Joe and family and 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 just never never leaving your brother because even if your brother's on another team he's still your brother and you got his back for life and da, 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 da. and i'm just i'm, I'm just not just down in the back of my mind I'm thinking like yeah yeah that's how i feel about my boys yeah yeah <laughs> and uh and after we were done uh he was like y'all good and we was like yeah we we we, we good and he was like all right and there was never a moment that came anywhere close to that for the rest of my yeah. time knowing, knowing KG. Never had a <laughs> moment like that before. And uh, I'm glad that I wasn't by myself because I got at least two witnesses who were mm-hmm. there with me to actually see this amazing moment where Kevin Garnett opened up. Like, he never really opens up. Uh, and again, there wasn't this, he, he didn't give us anything that was like earth shattering or anything like that, but it was a really small group. And he was giving us insight into how he saw team building and, and teamwork and, and teammates. And that's something that, that I'd never heard him speak of in that type of, with that type of length, that type of bandwidth to it. And it, again, for me, you know, yes, he's got the whole, you know, throwing shit up in the air and he's banging his head on the stanchion and, 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 you know, he's, you know, sweating, you know, cl- you got like 15 minutes before the game start and he's like sweating as if he just played, you know, 50, 60 minutes, triple overtime game. Um, yeah. But I think about that moment um, in Minnesota when I think about KG uh, and just what he – just that passion that he has. Um, that's why when he went to uh, Boston, I remember Chauncey and I used to talk about this in Detroit because Chauncey was a big reason why KG eventually decided to sign, you know, long-term with, with Boston. And Chauncey, who knows him well, was just like, look, man, there's nobody passionate about winning. He was like, because you got guys who are passionate about playing. You got guys who are passionate about the game itself, but passionate about winning. No one touches KG. And that's the thing that when I think about him and his legacy, that's the legacy that I'm always going to latch on to, the fact that he was passionate about winning. Uh, and you don't see that these days. Uh, yeah. We talk about guys who lack effort, but shit, be passionate about trying to get that W. Um, and you don't see that. You really don't. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. Are those you, Cheetos you, behind you? What's up? Me? Yeah. No, that's um. We don't like to give free ads usually, but that's a uh, Dunkin' Donuts ground coffee. Okay. Looks like Cheetos from here. Oh, I wish. Man. No, it's just ground coffee. Okay. Because I've got some Cheetos. That's, that's, they're not a sponsor, so I can't even show you what they are. Never mind. Yeah, please don't. We can't afford to, <laughs> yeah. to waste any oh, I, look, on I'm, I'm, I'm hard. Look. Listen, I <laughs> just you know, kidding. I, I know, believe me, believe me. We, we go through this, we go through this at least once every other week where you know we'll be munching on something and be like, oh, and I never mind. I can't do that now because they're not paying, they're not they're no, not keeping the sorry. lights on. I say this all the time. The only thing well, I advertise are these random pictures of my family behind me and uh 
the eight different teams that Soapy roots for behind him. So that's about <laughs> oh, it. Wow. But uh, but no, man, we'll, we'll let you get out of here. I know we probably kept you a little longer than we expected, so appreciate that. Before before we do though, real quick, where's the best place for uh for everyone to find you online uh, and keep oh, following? Oh gosh, you? uh, I'm I'm always on Twitter. Uh, a Shrod uh-huh. Blakely, A S H E double R O D B L A K E L Y. Uh, Twitter, um, Facebook, uh, and also CLNS Media. Uh, yep. a lot of my my uh my podcast, the A List podcast with Kwani A Lunas. You can find our content there. Uh, yeah. Let me see. Bleacher Report. I, 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 uh, NBA writer for them as well. And I told you guys I teach, but that there's no way to plug that. BSJ. You know, you going to school. Boston Sports Journal. Oh, that's I right. A, a yeah. weekly column for them. Um, I'm trying to keep all the like uh, the revenue in, uh, streams in, in mind. Um, locker yeah. room. I think those are the big ones. And locker room is locker is room. Locker room, locker and room also sick. Be- the locker yeah. room app, yo. Locker room's I, dope. I've totally slept on how live yeah. locker room is. Same. I it's a lot of fun. That. It is it's pretty a cool. lot of fun. Hell of yeah. fun. Uh, locker room is, is in the Garden Report. Obviously, we do that right after every Celtics game. We jump on there. Yeah. Me, Jimmy Toscano, uh, Joe Sway, uh, John Zanis, and Bobby Manning, uh, who yeah. is <laughs> he's another one. He's a killer yeah. guy. He is. Yeah, so you so. don't have any um like product codes we can offer our listeners for like tuition discounts at BU or anything like that? <laughs> Let use, me like, get my tuition discount off. first, and then I can work on like <laughs> <enough>. others. <laughs> all right, that's not all how good. this works. All right, appreciate that. But all right, man, thanks for stopping by, and uh, we'll oh. get into the Celtic series. Oh my bad. Go ahead, so real quick, Sherrod. I told Nick because uh, he was, I think he was talking about like doing a giveaway during the last um, locker room. Oh, he was like putting that out to the chat. I said he should consider having a guest come on the um, Garden Report for like a guest fan. <clears throat> we do that now. Sir. Oh, don't choose like, him. Like there's a there's a there's a couple folks that we uh that are like regulars and like I I don't know if it's their timing is great, but there's certain people who always find a way to be on and have like a platform like we've got one guy named dudley dudley has like the mm-hmm. deepest voice on a planet uh oh, i like dudley, dudley is, <laughs> he's he's the shit dudley's like one of my favorite people and then we got another we got another woman named karen and mm. you all know karen is just not the name to be having these not names. a good time to be <laughs> our karen our karen yeah. is awesome yeah she's awesome because she in some way shape or form will somehow incorporate fire brad into whatever her monologue. <laughs> yeah. She is she is so done with Brad Stevens, it's not even funny. And so, um, but yeah, we we we've got some regulars that that we have in, in locker room that that get mm-hmm. a pretty good runway to kind of talk about anything and everything. Um, but look, Nick's Nick's the maestro. I, I mm, he's sure. the point guard. I'm I'm just out here taking shots, man. I'm like no, Ray I'm Allen. Sure. I, I'm just taking shots. Uh, I don't bring the ball up. I'm not mm-hmm. running point. I'm not calling the shots. I just take shots. So. Bro, I, I remember the first time I heard Dudley jump on the app. I I honestly thought it was like uh like he had like a voice change or something. <laughs> like it was like one of those like ex like ex drug dealers on like a documentary about drug dealers when they can't like reveal that. Yeah, and, yeah, he sounded I mean, like witness protection distortion. That's what, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dud, Dudley's got a great. He's the man though. He is uh, pretty funny. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's right. good people. Good. All right, man. We'll let you go for real. Have a good night. And uh, anytime you want to come back, man, we'd love to have you maybe after the season when your time frees up a little more. Oh, so that you mean like next week? Ooh, ooh, stop. Stop. Oh, damn. Yeah, so anyway, are you free a week from today? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to shock right. the world. Yeah. Thank All you, right, brother. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. See you, man. Later.